Hey everybody, Mike here from The Art of Guitar. My head's kind of spinning because the last four days have been insane for me. I saw three concerts. My nephew flew in from out of town to see one of them. We did a podcast together, and I just thought it'd be a really cool thing to do some concert reviews. Ding, ding. And uh, it'd be a good way to organize my memories of the show and just put it down and then share it with you guys. So the concerts I saw were Pantera and then Metallica twice because they're doing like a double show type thing for this tour. And I had tickets for Metallica for over a year, so I was getting really excited as the date approached. But all of a sudden, my friend Christopher, who I was taking to see Metallica, asked me if I wanted to try to see Pantera the night before. He's like, I guess they're doing some surprise club show. And he said it was going to be at First Avenue. And my heart sunk a little bit because I thought, oh man, that's not that big of a club for a band like Pantera. So it's going to be really hard, if not impossible, to get tickets to this thing. So I had a lot of friends that were trying to get tickets, but the next day when they went on sale, it sold out in like five minutes. I don't know if you know anybody like this, but my friend Christopher is really lucky when it comes to getting tickets. He ended up getting four tickets when all my other friends struck out. I got real excited because I felt like I could finally vindicate myself for not seeing Pantera back in 1992 when I had a chance to. Luckily, I was able to see them years later at OzFest, so I was able to see Dimebag and Vinny in the band, so I feel really good about that. But I thought, man, if I could see Pantera now at First Avenue, even though it's two of the original members, but we have Charlie and Zach as well, so that's awesome. I thought that would still be a once-in-a-lifetime type event. So I wake up on gig day and I'm all excited, you know, but I realize I don't have any Pantera shirts. The ones I used to have are long gone. So I put on a tool shirt and I made sure to put on this necklace, because this is kind of my uh, tribute to Dimebag, because he used to wear one of these razor necklaces too. By the way, before I started filming this, I realized I didn't have it, so I ran all the way home. I had to make sure to have this. Because it's a Pantera video, but also because it's Dimebag's birthday today, I guess. So this is uh, in honor of Dimebag on his birthday. Well, as I got ready, I kept getting more and more excited, but then I got some bad news. I heard that Greg Kinn passed away that day. And then shortly after that, I saw on my Facebook feed that Jack Russell passed away from Great White. And you know how they say things like that tend to happen in threes? Well, that kind of made me a little defensive the rest of the day because I kept thinking, you know, who's next? All these legends seem to be dropping like flies lately. So that freaked me out. So we all met at Christopher's studio, which is real close to First Avenue. It was four of us. It was me, Christopher, the drummer for Sanctus, uh, Corey, the bass player for Sanctus, and his brother. So we jumped in Chris's vehicle and we made our pilgrimage to the legendary First Avenue. It's always fun driving there because I always relive old memories. It's like, you know, memory lane for me, literally. And you pass by all the buildings and structures on the way to First Avenue that I grew up seeing. And it's funny, we passed by the strip bar. It was the first one I ever went to when I was younger. And uh, you got to love that motto. Three ugly ones. Who thought of that? We ended up parking really close to First Ave. We only had to walk like two blocks. And all of a sudden, there it was, First Avenue. You could see all the stars on the walls. And the best part was you could see an entire group of people in line to get in. And it wrapped all the way around the side of the building. So we walked all the way down the line. Uh, someone said, hey, Mike. It was a subscriber. He recognized me. And for this show, I had had picks made that were Art of Guitar picks. And I just kept a few with me. I thought it'd be cool to give them to people if they know the channel or something like that. So I give them a pick. And we went all the way to the back of the line. And we stood behind this lady who was wearing this Metallica hoodie or whatever. And it was so appropriate because I'm like, the next day we're going to see Metallica at US Bank Stadium. Standing in line at First Avenue is not the worst thing in the world as long as the weather is good. I've been there when it was freezing temperatures when it was raining all these different conditions but this day was actually really great for weather and we just stood there and took in the whole you know vibe of everything everybody was excited i got a close-up look on all the stars on the walls they change you know from year to year so i was curious to see who was still left up there and then there was this guy standing there that had a i need beer sign and uh, that's not nearly as weird as it sometimes gets there, but I thought that was kind of funny. As we got to the front, uh, the anticipation kept building, and I remembered what it was like when I was a kid going there for the first time, how nervous I was. I could hear the metal bands playing inside, and uh, we are walking through the front doors, and they checked our IDs. We went through the metal detector, and as soon as I stepped inside, all the emotions from the past hit me. To the left, they have this merch area where they sell First Avenue merchandise, and then to the right of that, you could see the entryway to the 7th Street entry, which if you don't know, no. 
First Avenue and 7th Street are connected. And we've played there a few times. It's a lot smaller. It's like this tiny club next to First Avenue. And the stage is a lot smaller. And when bigger bands play in there, it gets so packed and so hot and sweaty in there. It's just insane. But that's actually what a lot of people like about the 7th Street entry. And as you walk around the front wall, the whole place opens up and you see the full stage. You see the entire venue. And it's kind of breathtaking because of the history, but also because, you know, I just always think this place is the place in Purple Rain. You'd think I'd be used to it now, but uh, it still blows me away every time I think of that. It also reminded me of all the shows I've seen there over the years. Everyone from Jeff Buckley to Weezer to Dream Theater. Uh, so many, I can, can't even name them all. But uh, I think the one that stands out the most to me, though, was Testament. Because that was the loudest and most insane concert I can remember. I was going up the stairs to go to the bathroom and Testament was playing and I could feel the walls shaking. And, uh, you know, a few years later, actually, Theory of a Dead Man was playing and tiles and stuff were falling from the ceiling. And I kept thinking, man, when Pantera starts up, it's probably going to be just as crazy. So I really hope they fixed everything up there. And then it occurred to me how weird it was that the screen that's usually down in front of the stage was already up. I mean, you couldn't really see anything on the stage because it was covered up with blankets and the drum set was covered up with like these big black bags. So there was no spoilers. But I thought, man, I wish the screen was down so that it could come up when the band starts. Because that's a real epic moment. Anytime you go see a band at First Avenue. But then my friend told me that there was no open Bennett. It was actually going to be a comedian. And typically I'd be bummed out about that, but Jim Brewer kind of normalized that when he opened for Metallica. Ooh. <laughs> now back in the early days when Pantera played, I would have been afraid for this comedian because people want to see Pantera and hear this guy is on a microphone talking to them. I could just imagine people throwing bottles at him if it was back in the old days. But today it's a little bit different. The crowd's older, more mature, and uh, you know everybody's just happy to be there. I figured I'd get a drink, hit the bathroom, and just get ready for the show. So I went to the bathroom, and it's funny because they still have the urinal trough there that goes all the way across the back wall. Not a lot of places have those anymore. They got rid of those, but first. First Avenue still has it. It's kind of a weird feeling to stand shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of guys, just everybody's peeing at the same time. I don't know why, it just is a weird experience. And then I turned around to leave and I saw that on the wall, they still have the old dispenser where they have like aspirin and other things. And back in the day, they had horny goat weed. I had no idea what it was, but I remember buying it and just sticking it in my wallet. By the way, I never used it. It just kind of, you know, rotted away to nothing next to the condom that I never used either. Those were confusing days. So then I went in line to get a drink. And this guy comes up and he's like, hey, man, I watch your channel. Congratulations. I, I really love it. And we talked for a little bit and then I offered him a pick. I'm like, hey, man, do you want an art of guitar pick? And he goes, no, thanks. And he just walks away. <laughs> As I continued to stand in line, there's a lot of people, keep in mind, uh, the comedian starts up, but he comes out and says that he's Pantera's road manager, and he starts, you know, ripping on the band a little bit, and everybody's loving it. The crowd was super engaged the entire time, this comedian. By the way, his name was Craig Gass. One, two, three. <laughs> He told us that it was going to be a live recording and the crowd went nuts and he gave us some directions. He's like, okay, when Phil comes out, I want everybody to ask, uh, Phil, where are your shoes? And so we practiced and I think they recorded us saying that in unison. Uh, it's because Phil never wears shoes on stage. And then Rex, he said, uh, say happy birthday, Rex. And I forgot what Charlie's was. But for Zach Wilde, it was really strange because the guy goes, yeah, when Zach comes out, I want everybody to say... Show us your dick, Zach, or something like that. And I have to admit, it was so surreal to see an entire sold out First Avenue all chanting together. Let me see your dick, Zach. Oh, and Craig does the best Sam Kinison impression. It was dead on. We got a lot of fans here. Down in hell. We think you're the best! Oh! oh! <laughs> But I have to say his Lars Ulrich was lacking a little bit. Uh, it's really hard to emulate Lars's voice, I guess, as well as his drum beats, too. I went to buy a T-shirt, but the line was so long, I just said, no, I'll just wait for a better time to go, maybe while Pantera was playing. So Craig got done with his set, and everybody started to flood out, you know, to get drinks and go to the bathroom and stuff before Pantera. I thought, this is the perfect time to swoop in and get a really great spot on the floor. So me, Chris, Corey, and Nate all ended up on the floor near the soundboard, which is a great place to be in most venues, but we stood against this railing that was next to this ramp that goes up to the next level, and we were pushed up against it. And I got a little bit nervous because I thought, you know what, we're up against this rail, but when everybody comes flooding in, 
it's going to get really tight and we're going to constantly be pushing against this metal bar and I could feel it pushing into my side. But I just decided to stand there and take my chances. You know, it looked like the crowd was a little bit older, so I didn't think there was going to be a lot of rowdy stuff going on. I didn't even think they would mosh. I thought, you know, we're all a lot older now. We don't want to break our hips or something, you know. So we just stood there against the railing. But then things started to fill up. People were coming down the ramp and all of a sudden the floor got crowded and I felt my space slowly getting squeezed away. And next thing I knew, you know, people are just bumping into you, hitting your elbow and stuff. And you just got to get used to that feeling when you're in that situation. And it started to get a little more hot in there. You know, the moisture was kind of rising. And it's easy to start to get a little bit freaked out because you might think, oh my gosh, I might be trapped here. So the way my brain works is I always look for escape routes and I found two. I was like, just up there is a stairwell. I could go up to the second floor where it's a lot less crazy, or I could get around this damn rail and go up the ramp and get out the back way. So I didn't feel too nervous about it. Just then my friend Nate points to the right side of the stage and he goes, oh my God, Metallica's here. And he said that kind of loud and people around him heard. All of a sudden, everybody started to look and I could hear people like, you know, whispering to each other. And then I heard this roar start up in the crowd and everyone's like, look, you could see Kirk Hammett. Rob was there. He was kind of standing on the DJ booth on the side. And we're like, I can't believe Metallica's here. It just seems like they're slumming coming to a place like First Ave. <laughs> and the screen had come down and they put Pantera's logo in red all the way across. It looks so badass. And that's why I started to feel the crowd start to move in waves. And it was a really insane feeling. And I was so happy because I knew I was going to have that screen rising moment. Uh, I was actually in the crowd a lot when that happened, but I was also on stage a few times. And uh, that's stuff you just don't forget. That feeling of seeing the screen go up and seeing the crowd all looking up at you. But it's almost as cool being on the other side and watching the screen go up as your favorite band is slowly being revealed. So the music starts getting a little bit louder. You can tell people are getting more excited. I'm feeling myself getting more and more squished. I'm feeling like a sardine all of a sudden. And I'm looking and my initial escape route is being cut off completely. There's no way I'm getting up to that stairwell. So I thought, you know what? My only chance is to get around this railing so I can get up from the back way if things get too crazy. And then they started playing footage from, I think, the Vulgar video where uh, it's like this old VHS we used to have. So people started cheering when they saw Dimebag and Vinny. And the, the band as, you know, young guys, it was kind of interesting to see that. But then they flashed this silhouette of Dimebag and Vinny. And that's when the crowd just screamed. And that's also when the screen started slowly going up. I asked my friend, what do you think they're going to start with? And for some reason, I just had this psychic moment and I thought a new level would be so cool. And right as I said that, you could hear them kicking into the song as the screen went up. So I was right about what the first song was going to be, but I was dead wrong when it came to me thinking that people weren't going to mosh. Instantly, as soon as the first note hit, a circle pit started up. And I felt myself getting pushed into the railing each time with a little bit more force, and I felt it hitting my spine. So I did my best to fight it off, you know, but the whole time I'm like worried for my life because I thought if everybody just decides to fall to the left, I'm pretty much dead. And once the screen was all the way up, it was like, there they are in real life, Pantera, well, half a Pantera. There's Phil without his shoes. There's Rex looking really skinny, by the way. He looked like he weighed 100 pounds. Uh, there's Charlie back there. He looks like he's really concentrating, really trying to do Vinnie Paul's parts justice. And there's Zach Wild, one of my heroes, looking like he just stepped off a Viking ship. After that, they kicked in the mouth for war and then strength beyond strength. And it was on the breakdown of that song that I decided to get the hell out of there. I knew that if it kept building and building, I was dead. So I look back, my friends seem fine, you know. They're bigger guys or whatever. So I couldn't get around the railing and there was security there. So I had to take a chance and go over the rail. And whenever you climb things at First Avenue, they pull you down because they don't want any craziness, you know. But when I did it, I think they knew that I was just trying to escape. So they let me do it. They were really cool about it. But I had to go over the rail like WWF going over the rope style. And I put my foot down and I just kind of flipped over the rail. And then I had to fight my way to get back to the next level close by where the bar was. I could feel that my asthma was starting to kick in so I got out at the exact right time and it felt so good to have some space finally I could breathe some air I went and got another drink went to the bathroom and then I looked and the merch table was completely without a line and I was like perfect timing so I went up there and my friend Chris was working there again he's the guy that I met at the Judas Priest concert who knew my channel and so we talked a little bit and uh, he just seems to be at all the concerts that I go to now I looked around this area where the merch was and I noticed that there was still a Miss Pac-Man machine and that 
that machine used to save me because I hated just socializing back when I was in my teenage metal band. So I would escape and I would just play Miss Pac-Man the whole time whenever I could. So that was still there, but I didn't have any quarters. Then I look to the right and I see this little aisle that leads to the backstage room. You know, the whole dressing area where Metallica was. And I saw who was guarding it. And it was like this young girl. So I went up to her and I was actually going to see, I knew it was a long shot, if she would let me in just to shake their hands and then walk out. So I went up to her and I instantly kind of got nervous as soon as I started talking to her. I'm like, is Metallica really back there? She's like, yeah. And then I was like, did you meet them? And she's like, uh, nope. And for some reason, I suddenly just lost all my courage and I couldn't even ask her. I was just like, oh, okay, thanks, bye. And I walked away awkwardly. Not my smoothest moves. Isn't it weird that the only thing standing between me and Metallica was this girl that I feel like I could have easily done like a jujitsu arm drag and got past? I'm glad I didn't though, because I'd probably be in jail right now if I had succeeded. <laughs> It was then that my friend texted me and he's like, are you okay? Because all he saw was me jump over the rail and like run off, you know? And uh, so I said, yeah, I'm fine. And he was like, can you get me a t-shirt? So I went back and I visited my friend Chris, got another t-shirt. Oh, and by the way, this is the t-shirt you probably guess, but no frills. You know, it says Pantera on the front. Then on the back, the coolest part is that it's one of those customized for the gig t-shirts. So, you know, the stars in honor of First Avenue. And it's really cool because you know if you have this t-shirt, you went to that concert or you knew somebody who went. I decided to explore the venue a little bit more. So I went upstairs and I heard them kick into a bunch of killer songs like I'm Broken. And then they played one of the songs that I really wanted them to play, which was Suicide Note Part 2. When that heavy part kicked in... <laughs> I just got chills looking down at the band and seeing the entire crowd just circle pitting and going crazy. Then they actually slowed down and played This Love, followed by fucking Hostile. And once they kicked into that, I felt like it was a full circle event because, you know, the 1992 concert that I missed, they opened with that. And here I am seeing them playing it. Well, half of the original Pantera playing it, but it was still intense. <laughs> Zach Wilde really does dime big justice, and I can't think of a better guitar player to replace him. And, you know, the whole time they're honoring the two fallen brothers. The kick drums had a picture of each of them. And then on the sides, you know, they had actually four kick drums. Two of them, I think, were fake kick drums. They were, like, like real shallow looking. But it was great to see that. And Phil made it a point to say, you know, we're doing this for them. And I really felt like they were being sincere. You know, you could really tell that they're doing this in the honor of Dimebag and Vinny. And that really made the crowd get into it even more. You don't feel like you're seeing, like, a tribute band. You're seeing the real thing because, in spirit, the two brothers are there, too. I knew I was going to have to accept the fact that I was not going to be able to get back to the floor area. I was just going to have to stand back a ways and uh, view it from there. And by the way, First Avenue isn't so big that it sounded bad from the back. It sounds really good everywhere you go in that venue, and the sight lines are great. Just the way it's set up, no matter how far back you are, you can always see the band. That being said, though, the area that I was in was full of rowdy people, and everybody had their arms up. People were using their phones a lot. And so when they kicked into walk, I actually couldn't see the band until halfway through the song. I heard this crazy cheer happen, though, while they started the tune, but I thought it was just because everyone loves the song walk obviously but it's also because kirk hammett and rob walked pardon the pun onto the stage and they were singing back up for some of it but it was weird because by the time i was able to see what was going on in film i gotta quit saying film record uh they we were like walking around the stage awkwardly and then they left and i kept thinking is that because metallica is so huge they don't know what to do anymore on a little stage they're so used to their mile long circular stadium stages i don't know and i thought it was so cool to see guys in metallica you know actually going to a place like first avenue to support their friend's band james and lars weren't there though i just assume they're at some art museum or something i don't know what they do then the band kicked into a domination hollow medley which was killer and i was kind of near the area where i was watching Watching Testament and feeling the walls vibrate and I realized that even though Pantera was crushing it they still weren't as loud as Testament was so I have to say that Testament is still in the lead when it comes to who was the heaviest band I ever saw live you could hear the beginning of Cowboys from Hell starting up and the lights started doing their strobe thing that they always do during Cowboys from Hell and I got real excited but I also got choked up for some reason you know it's really weird to get choked up during a brutally heavy song 
But as it kicked in, I started to think about the first time I heard Pantera as a kid, and I heard it on a cassette tape, and that's when they won me over because I was a huge Metallica, Megadeth fan, you know. And all of a sudden, all these jocks in my school were talking about Pantera. So at first, I didn't like the band because I thought that was just some jock metal band or something. But once I got the cassette and heard the beginning part of Cowboys from Hell, I was won over immediately. And then I started to think of Dimebag and Vinny, and I got a little bit emotional. So it was really weird to watch everybody just having a great time, and I was standing back there kind of holding my necklace feeling bad but that eventually passed afterwards the band took a bow and i think they were going to be done but the crowd wouldn't let them stop we just kept cheering and then they kind of talked to each other on stage and they ended up playing one last song and it was a song off of reinventing the steel i didn't think they were going to play anything off of that so i was kind of bummed out but then they kicked into yesterday don't mean sh I didn't want to get greedy, but there were still a handful of songs that I wanted to hear that they didn't play. And I thought I would just give you my short list real quick. I was hoping they would play... Primal Concrete Sledge, Psycho Holiday, Heresy, Cemetery Against the Artist Shredding, Rise, By Demons Be Driven, Five Minutes Alone, Slaughtered, Throws of Rejection, Drank the Waters, Living Through Me, Floods, God, I'm Electric, Revolution is My Name, and even Power Metal. That would have been crazy. So any of those would have made a killer encore as well, in my opinion. Now, the best part of standing far back at this venue is that as soon as the show is over, you can run out the doors, the front doors. It was one of those rare, perfect weather summer nights in Minnesota. So I just stood out in front and I enjoyed watching people come out with smiles on their faces. Everybody was beaming. And I had a few more subscribers come up to me, which is really cool. So I ended up giving away all my picks that night. So that made me real excited. And guess who was still standing out there? The I need a beer guy. He was still hanging out. So eventually my friends came out and we were all talking about how much fun we had. We went to the car and we realized that even though tonight was a blast, we still had Metallica tomorrow and then Sunday. So it was going to be a Friday and a Sunday because they took the Saturday, the in-between day off. And I was like, I don't know if I can handle this much intensity in one weekend. But, uh, you know, I did. And I have a lot to say about the Metallica show, too. So keep an eye out for that review. That'll come out in a couple days. So I hope you guys enjoyed this review slash recap. I feel like it was a once-in-a-lifetime event for me to witness. And so I feel really happy sharing it with anybody who wasn't able to go. And if you were at the show, let me know and uh, leave a comment and tell me what your experience was. Hopefully it was as great as mine. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll catch you soon with that Metallica review. Okay, bye-bye.